Georgia, 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 Georgia. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Abadi, and I am pleased to introduce a new show. It's actually a mini series, uh, All Eyes on Georgia. We're going to be looking at the uh, crucial runoff Senate election that's coming up January 5th in the great state of Georgia. Um, I was actually mentally to get through election season was saying that the Reagan era would end in 2020 with uh, Donald Trump's loss. Um, and uh, much like uh, the FDR era ended with uh, Jimmy Carter's loss in 1980. So it just seemed really nice and clean. 1980 to 2020 would be the Reagan era and it would be over. Um, however, the election did not come out as strong a repudiation of, of Reaganism as I would have liked. Um, and here we are all awaiting Jimmy Carter's Georgia to help us find out if we can leave the um, Reagan era definitively. Um, so I am quite, quite pleased to introduce a couple of historians who have agreed to help me sort out um, the, uh, the eras of American history and the, uh, the people of Georgia's uh, hearts and soul. Um, Frank Towers is a historian at University of Calgary in Canada. He's the author of The Urban South and the Coming Civil War. And he's also edited the book, uh, Remaking North American Sovereignty with uh, Jules Spangler's partner. He uh, also teaches about and does public talks about recent US political history. And I believe Remaking North American Sovereignty is just out, Frank. It is, it is a 2020 book, Fordham University Press, Get, get your copies before they run out. Uh, much congratulations there. Um, Matt Stanley is, um, teaches in Georgia. Uh, he's a historian at Albany State University, and he's the author of The Loyal West, Civil War, and the Reunion in Middle, Middle America. And uh, he has, I believe, upcoming, The Grand Army of Labor, Workers, Veterans, and the Meaning of the Civil War. Um, Matt, that is out, nearly out, in time for the holidays. No, you can you can buy it for Easter. I think it's going to be a okay. yeah. excellent, yeah. Big, big Easter gift, uh, March fifteenth. Yeah, it comes with a ham. Sort yeah. of. <laughs> um, so I, I thank you guys so much for um, taking the time here. Um, just a little background: Georgia has just over ten million people in it. Uh, two Republican senators right now. One elected is David Perdue, and the other one was appointed, Kelly Loeffler. Um, Trump won the state uh, by 5% in 2016 and lost it by like three tenths of a percent this time. Um, nearly 5 million Georgians went to the polls. Uh, neither senator won the 50% necessary to secure their seat. Purdue beat the Democratic challenger, John Ossoff, with 49.7% of the vote. So. He didn't get his 50. And Loeffler actually lost to Raphael Warnock, the uh, Democratic challenger, 33% um, to 26%. But the Republican vote was split there. Uh, what's the guy's name? Doug Collins was, was also running. Um, so yeah. I'd actually like to start with um, Matt, who is living in Georgia and is, is getting a sense of probably the inundation um, of, this, of this election. And if you could just um, kind of set the scene the, and who these players are and a little bit maybe about the Georgia electorate as well. Yeah, um, you've basically got, um, you know, a pretty stark uh, contrast here uh, uh, between uh, the Democrats and the Republican incumbents. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the senior senator right now is David Perdue, uh, who was elected in 2014. He defeated Michelle Nunn who, uh, you know, whose, whose family name in Georgia runs pretty deep with, uh, you know, former Senator, Democratic Senator Sam Nunn, who was sort of a, one of the last sort of Dixiecrats um, uh, from this region. Um, he is, I think he was the CEO of Reebok uh, at one point, now the CEO of Dollar General. So he's a, a businessman in, in, in finance and, and uh um, you know, quite, quite, quite a, I can't remember his net worth. It's uh, in, in the tens of millions, though. 
Um, so, you know, he's one of the, in a, in a, in a, rel in a relatively wealthy U.S. Senate, he's, 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 he's wealthy even by those standards. Uh, so, yeah, he's the senior senator. Um, uh, his challenger um, is John Ossoff, who probably most Americans know more than they should based on that high profile um, special election uh, to Georgia 6th District. I think it was yeah, fall 2017 in which he lost a really narrow race that was, uh, you know, had a lot of, a lot of national money and a lot of national uh, attention behind it. Um, he's kind of a party center Democrat who was born in Atlanta. He's Jewish. Uh, I think he went to Georgetown, maybe um, London School of Economics. But his background, he's, he's an investigative journalist, um, lost Georgia 6 in 2017. Uh, yeah, high profile race. He was endorsed by John Lewis, Stacey Abrams, Bernie Sanders. Um, young guy, uh, late 30s. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, Purdue barely missed uh, the 50%. Uh, majority vote in, in the runoff. Um, I'm sorry, in the, uh, on the November 3rd vote. Um, on the other side, you have Kelly Leffler, who's only been in the U.S. Senate for a little less than a year. She was the appointee by our governor, Brian Kemp, um, to replace Johnny Isaacson, who had, who, who had, who had dropped out of the Senate for health reasons. Um, she is uh, the wealthiest uh, sitting senator. Um, in the, and she and her husband, Jeffrey Sprecher, who is uh, the uh, chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the founder of International Intercontinental Exchange, um, big uh, financial services guy. Um, she and him together, the combined wealth is over $500 million. Uh, she's the owner of the Atlanta Dream WNBA team, longtime GOP donor. Um, and, you know, uh, she and Collins in that November 3rd contest, you were sort of vying for who is the most pro-Trump Republican and so she's touted her 100% Trump voting record, um, very hostile to, to, to Black Lives Matter and other racial justice uh, initiatives and, and movements in Georgia, um, has, uh, you know, has strong opinions about COVID um, that we can talk about later. Um, but just introducing her, yeah, very wealthy. Um, and, and sad, you know, uh, also I will say she's, she's not a Georgia native. She's, she's from Illinois, uh, where I'm from. Um, and she's being opposed by Raphael Warnock, um, who is... Uh, Probably a left of center, a party center Democrat, at least by Georgia standards. Um, you know, in contrast with, with Leffler's wealth, uh, Warnock's sort of origin story is that he grew up in public housing in Savannah, attended Morehouse uh, Divinity School. Now he's been the minister of Martin Luther King's former church, uh, uh, Ebenezer Baptist in Atlanta. He's been the, the, the minister there for, for about 15 years kind of has a history of being involved in progressive movements um, and uh, decided to run uh, for public office. Frank, you want to underline any, anything about any of these four characters? I mean, I think that, you know, Matt's given us a great, uh, great overview of the race. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said here, of course, and it comes out in Matt's contrast. We've got two extremely rich Republican senators. Their, um, you know, their COVID stock deals, um, I suspect, are, are part of the part of the race as well. Um, Ossoff, to me, is is interesting because he's so young. You know, he just he, my understanding is he got involved in the 06 uh, in the 2018 race because no one else would. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, surprised everybody by by getting close. Has uh, he held elective office? I don't think so. No. Um, he's been a campaign staffer, you know, and he's, is he, is he, is he 35 or is he younger than that? I was thinking, yeah, mid, yeah, mid thirties, 35, 36. I think he's yeah, slightly younger than I am. He looks a lot younger, but, um, but, uh, yeah, th mid thirties. I suppose the other thing to say here is the, is the unique circumstances of the Georgia runoff system where you have to win by 50, uh, 50 percent plus, you have to win by over 50% to win the election. And so in, in this case, nobody got over 50. They're going to the runoff. Traditionally, Republicans have won the runoffs. It's been a long time since the Democrat has won the runoff. There's lots of talk of, oh, maybe this time with the Stacey Abrams turnout model or with Trump calling into question um, every, you know, the uh, governor and the secretary of state, there might be some break there for the Democrats. But, but the, you know, the the handicappers, I think, would say the Republicans are, are favored in this just because their voters turn out and it'll be a test of Democrats if they can match it this time. Right. Um, and can we imagine? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just going to say, I also wanted to point out that the, 
that uh, the 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 design of of the runoffs um, that uh, favors you know that has historically favored well, one party over the other um, was uh, you know that was that was that was by design that this is a, a sort of a vestige a relic of old South Dixiecrat politics um, and the idea of a runoff system was that the the uh, the state legislators would be able to deny or you know, control the outcome by denying someone a win with a mere plurality of the vote. Of course, black Georgians are a plurality. So the fear was that they would vote as a block and there would be multiple white candidates who would split the vote. Um, and uh, so it was, it, it was an explicit, you know, I, I, it doesn't get talked about enough anymore, but this was, you know, this was something that was designed to dilute black voting power and has had that effect, uh, as Frank mentioned. Um, so in the past, you know, these contests of heavily favored Republicans, because you see a drop off in Democratic votes. Um, I mean, I think in, you know, Winch Fowler in 1992, for instance, um, who ran way ahead of, of Bill Clinton um, in the, in the, on election day, um, but didn't reach that 50%. There was a runoff, Democratic uh, participation fell, and he lost his elected office to the Republican. I can't remember who the Republican was. Uh, but something similar happened to Saxby Chambliss in, two, Chambliss in 2008, uh, the big you know, blue wave in 2008, the Obama year, um, where he, he, uh, the Republican did not reach the 50%. And it was really close uh, uh, between he and the Democrat. And then he you know, sort of blew the, the Democratic challenger out uh, in, you know, a few weeks later in the runoff. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to point out the sort of the the sort of racist origins of, of the, how this system works and why it's sort of this feature of Georgia politics. Yeah, that's, right. that's a great point, Matt. And just, you know, just to keep on this, I, I think when it was first crafted, there was, there was never a thought there'd be a two party, there'd really be a two party contest. It was, it was ultimately a way to resolve the democratic primary in, you know, in one party rule in the South. So yeah, it was always going to be the, the white Democrats are just going to come together in the general and, um, and the fix was in. Right. <laughs> Um, okay, guys, and actually Warnock, although it's, it, was, it was sort of flipped now that it's no longer the Dixiecrat South, um, you've got the uh, Warnock being denied his win, basically. Um, so the, the, effects, the effects remain. Yeah, um, because there was, a, there was a, another Democratic, there were a lot of different contenders, but there were, uh, or candidates, uh, but there was an, another major Democratic contender too, Joe Lieberman's son. Um, who at one point was up, you know, had, had 15, 16% of the vote. I can't remember what he ended up with, 4 or 5%. Um, but uh, it wasn't just two Republicans split and one Democrat. It was Democrats cons largely consolidating behind Warnock and the Republicans splitting between Leffler and Collins. I mean, the, the messed up part of this, uh, the, ir the irony of it is, I think, I'm not sure that if you added up the Republican votes in, in the special for the Warnock-Leffler race, that they, they might have had more votes than the Democrats. Yeah, Warnock, Warnock had the most votes, but Leffler and Collins were close enough that it. And the same thing in the Ossoff um, of Purdue race. Purdue Purdue was ahead, so this would be great irony if the uh, progressive candidates won only because of the runoff. Uh, because right. if they just done first past the post, you know, had a normal primary where Leffler would run against right. Warnock, the outcome, you know, she might have pulled it out. But now we'll we'll see with totally and with the whole you know the whole shebang at stakes here. If the Democrats can do it, they get control of the Senate. Um, so it makes it you know it makes it something that's getting a lot of attention. Right. Yes. Um, and as I I think we've done a nice job just the sh the who the characters are and and sort of the the structure of the race. Now up here in Vermont. We have very different, um, the dynamics are complete. We're, a, you know, we're a rural white blue state, which I know isn't, so we're really trying to wrap our heads around the Georgia electorate um, and, and the, sh the shape of it, you know, just the, the demographics I'm seeing. It looks like traditionally it's been kind of 60% white, 30% black, and then 10% Latino, Asian. But it looks like both the black and white vote, percentage of the vote is, is shrinking as, as um, Latino and Asian um, percentages come up. Um, and so if you could kind of shape that out a little bit, I'm curious, curious about like the, uh, the power of the white evangelical in, in, uh, in this race. Go ahead, Matt. 
Were you going to jump in? Yeah. Um, to act, was, yeah. The 20, 2020 was actually less racially. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was, okay. Uh, 2020 was actually less racially uh, divided by race and less divided by class than um, any Georgia election in, in, in recent memory. That's not to say that it wasn't, you know, strikingly divided by those things. It was just less strikingly divided by those things. Um, so you have, you know, changing um, uh, voter demographics um, in, in, in some sense, uh, as you said, uh, the, the black white polls um, becoming less, um, uh, less sort of the, 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 uh, the two sides of, of, of the electorate um, with an influx of um, non-white, non-black voters. Um, and that's, you know, that's lending itself to some type of, 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 of shift. But I think that, that there are a lot of different changes that account for that too. The state is becoming younger. Um, it's becoming, um, you know, Atlanta has, has grown. Um, there has there've been a lot of organizing uh, uh, efforts uh, among grassroots groups on the ground. And so what you see is this, you know, a, a, it's by no means is Georgia now, uh, you know, can be proclaimed a blue state, but you're seeing a purpling of the state that, you know, um, some pollsters have been predicting for, for several decades. I think Trump won by what we say five or six in, in 2016. Uh, Camp won by, I think, uh, beat Stacey Abrams um, in what was, a, you know, a very suspect election uh, by about 40 or 50,000 votes in 2018. Um, and the state had the largest increase of, of turnout in that midterm of any state in 2018. Um, and Biden wins this year by about, uh, what, 13 or 14,000 votes. I can't remember what, what he's last up by. Uh, but, the, uh, but the turnout, um, you know, for a, for a deep southern state um, compared to its, you know, neighboring states, uh, Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, the turnout has been uh, pretty massive in Georgia over the last few cycles. Uh, and it hit uh, about 68 percent this time, which means that Georgia – it was above the national average um, in voter turnout. Um, so, you know, some of the big, you know, shifts, even from 2016 to 2020, um, and, 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 you know, the reasons the state flipped blue this time, at least in terms of uh, the person at the top of the ticket, um, is Biden really saw um, an increase in, in older voters. Um, black voters uh, and non-white um, non-black voters went for uh, Biden at about the same rate that they went for Clinton in 2016. Um, really not that much different. The big gains for Biden um, were actually wealthier, whiter suburbanites. Um, tr basically, Trump lost ground among white and affluent voters um, by about 10 points. Uh, people making over $100,000 who identify as white. Uh, I think Clinton won about 20% of white voters in Georgia in 2016. Biden won about a third this time. So that's a, that's a pretty significant gap. And in sort of this, you know, the weird dynamics of the race, and you're seeing this in other states too, places like Virginia, um, uh, this, this really comes out, that Biden won the working, you know, working class, if you want to define, you know, earning, I mean, there's a lot of different ways we could define class, uh, but if you're looking at earners, uh, Biden won, I guess, low income voters, um, and he won the highest bracket of income voters. So those making under, you know, 40 or $50,000 a year, and those with households making over $100,000 a year, Biden won. Um, and Trump won the sort of middle uh, of, you know, 50, 60 to 100, $120,000 uh, household earners. Um, so, um, you know, that combined with Trump losing just a little bit of ground among white evangelicals was enough to put Biden over the top in a, in a, in a strong turnout year. I want to just build on a couple of things Matt's saying. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff in there I want to talk about. But um, you know, at some point, we should think about why Georgia was different than the two states it borders, Florida and South Carolina. It, you know, I think for Democrats, there was some, you know, wild dream that um, Jamie Harrison was going to beat um, Lindsey Graham, didn't come close. And that Florida, you know, was the more likely of those states. And Georgia actually was the, the place with, I mean, Georgia was the least likely um, looking at it in the polls ahead. North Carolina looked better, um, but Georgia did it. I think, you know, some of the now congealing conventional wisdom less than a month afterwards as Stacey Abrams was a big part of that. And I'd be curious to get Matt's take on it. But I want to talk about one, one zeroing in on this and plug a book. This is Matthew Lassiter's The Silent Majority, um, Sunbelt Politics or Suburban Politics and Sunbelt South. It's now about, it's now 14 years old. It's amazing. Um, the historian Kevin Cruz, who's more of a media figure, also wrote a very good book about Atlanta around the same time. But Lasseter really focused on the Republican, you know, 
the Southern strategy of Nixon, where the Republicans moved the South from being Democratic to majority Republican by picking up the white vote, you know, uh, often gets viewed as Nixon picking up the Wallace voters, the real redneck reactionary uh, people dug in on segregation. Uh, Redneck's not a good term, but you know, the uh, the rural white vote. And um, a lot of what Nixon won in uh, in the 70s was the suburban vote. And that certainly held through the Reagan era. And the, the county that's the most interesting to me here is Cobb County on in the greater Atlanta metro. That was that's an interesting place. Laster has a lot to say about it. Um, you know, it was a it was a county that had not many people in it. Marietta was its, it's a small town, but it took off because of Lockheed and Cold War defense contracting becomes a booming, fast growing place in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then some transplants move in from other states. Uh, famously, um, uh, um, New Gingrich and who was the guy? Barr, what was his first name? You guys remember him? He was a Clinton impeacher. I don't want to say, I think it was William Barr, but they're two of the reeling, leading, leading lights of the Gingrich majority including Gingrich himself, were from out of state. Barr was from Iowa, he was from Pennsylvania. They're part of that transplant wave. They pick up on evangelical voters. They talk a lot about sort of suburban values, but they're also, you know, diehard partisans. And Cobb County, in some ways, was the epicenter for the new Southern Republicanism, a lot like suburban Houston, where Tom DeLay came from. Biden won Cobb County. Um, that is, a, you know, a, a big transformation in the way that the Southern electorate looks. And you can see it happening across the South. You know, where that goes is a question, but it does create this weird coalition that Matt mentioned of real rich white people, very poor non-white people in, in something that looks sort of like the um, Rui Teixeira, John Judas idea of the new democratic majority from around 2000, um, widely discredited, but still compelling that there's some sort of, you know, uh, fusion there, but I, I think it's a real, um, the long-term stakes of that are, are something we talk about more. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Frank. So um, uh, I think a lot of people in the North have trouble understanding how um, Donald Trump, this kind of, you know, textbook New York con man could have any appeal in the South. And I'm just wondering, his attacks on some of the um, some of the institutions that are well known in Georgia, like the CDC, which is you know in Atlanta and is has been sequestered from the politics of Washington, um, and then also I, I don't know if Georgians have a lot of pride in like CNN to have a, a this this you know news network not in New York that it's it's it Atlanta based these these um, these institutions that um, Trump is really just. Uh, gone after. And I, and I don't know if there's, a, if there's some Georgia pride there on these institutions. And also, of course, Jimmy Carter, that pride. Um, any thoughts there, Matt? I mean, I call that the triple C's, Carter, the CDC, and CNN. Yeah, um, that's 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 a great question, Mike. And it's, it's a really complicated one. Um, I would say, yeah, Trump's appeal... Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, first of all, I would remind everyone that in 2016, you had a very divided Republican primary and Trump, um, you know, had a plurality of, of support that has since sort of co coalesced into this, uh, this, this, this um, reality where, where Trump is, a, you know, has a very high approval rating in his own party. So a lot of vehemently anti-Trump people and a lot of them, right, uh, sort of major national political figures like Lindsey Graham and others who you know, uh, vehemently anti-Trump to uh, then all of a sudden make this transition to um, almost uh, strangely, um, uh, um, you know, adoptive of this cult of personality uh, uh, around Trump. Um, but I think that Trump's appeal, um, just to simplify it, overly simplify it, uh, it, it, it depends, uh, depends on your context. I mean, you know, to, to, to evangelicals, he represents certain evangelical values uh, that, um, that they, uh, you know, particularly things um, uh, regarding abortion um, and different cultural. Wait, wait, oh, hold on, man. What are the marital fidelity, abortion? <laughs> Trump's had a few. Not, I, 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 <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not saying that this is the the objective reality. I'm saying this this is the reality of of okay. voter rationalization. Yeah, um, and it, actually, if we want to stay in Georgia and and speak about the pro life movement, 
it was a, a de at an immigration detention facility in Georgia where uh, we got real life forced sterilization. I, mean, I would think oh, sure. any, any pro-lifer would be up in arms. Um, you know, I think a lot of Republicans ended up coming around him. I have, you know, friends and acquaintances who, who, who you know, claimed they didn't vote for him or wouldn't vote for him in 2016, who ended up supporting him uh, vocally and, and, and proudly in 2020, because to them, he governed, despite the bluster, he governed like, a, like basically like Joe Khan. Uh, he was not all that different from, you know, um, uh, Bush or, or Romney or, or or any other number of Republicans, um, if you can get past, they didn't like Trump's aesthetic. Um, but if you look at what he pursued, which is tax cuts, conservative, you know, appointments to the court, those were the most important issues for them. Um, and they supported him. And of course, there are, are another whole nother uh, block of Republican voters who's Trump, who are, who, who's, who's, who are, uh, gravi do, do gravitate toward Trump's bluster um, and uh, to his sort of fake populism and his attacks on the CDC and CNN and other, you know, sort of well-known uh, elite institutions are part of this sort of fake populist veneer. Um, it is fake because, as you said, he is a New York billionaire, mil millionaire, however much money he has, whatever, an incredibly wealthy sort of plutocrat. Um, so the idea of sort of people backing him uh, who, uh, you know, who would find themselves in other scenarios sort of uh, um, averse to that type of figure um, is ironic. Um, but, you know, Trump has successfully curated this um, anti-authoritarian, in some sense, anti-establishment, hyper-masculine and sort of pro-gun, pro-Second um, Amendment um, um, uh, image that, um, that, that sticks with some people, even though what he's doing is sort of, you know, fleecing the public good and, and the public coffers. Is, I want to follow up on Mike's question. Does anybody there love Jimmy Carter? Or what, what do Republicans legacy. think about him? Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Democrats love Jimmy Carter. Liberals love Jimmy Carter. Um, by and large, uh, uh, black Georgians love Jimmy Carter. Um, he is a source of shame and embarrassment for the sort of conservative uh, elite. And, and, uh, I mean, he's, he's beloved even by some conservatives in southwest Georgia just because he's from this area or he's, you know, he's a, he's a local, local guy. Um, but by and large, uh, Jimmy Carter is very polarizing in this state. Um, and uh, it just really depends on your political, your partisan affiliation, your political ideology, how you feel about Carter. You know, I, mean, I, um, I, I surprised myself looking up in 1980, Carter won Georgia like 55 to 40. Reagan only got 40 percent in Georgia in 1980s. And I was yeah. I had I had in my mind that Georgia had walked away from him before he was even done his first term. But I was really glad to see um, he held his home state, which, you know, like Al Gore can't say that, you know, I mean, that's right. I mean, on that, on the, the Southern moderate um, Democratic, you know, great white hopes, Clinton, Gore, Carter, uh, yeah, I think Sam Nunn wanted to be that. There were a lot of people who had who had ambitions, but but those three really stand out. All three of their states completely repudiated them. You know, after Carter, uh, Democrats held Senate seats into the into the um, into the twenty first century in Arkansas, but now it's you know it's it's red as red can be, um, and it's you know it's I don't know quite know what to say about it, but there yeah the idea of um, regional loyalty partisan seems to be trumping all that stuff i hate to use that word now bastard um but it does you know it overrides it so um yeah they don't i, I don't know that's 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 sort of my take from a distance on 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 what what's going on there matt matt seems to agree if you're a democrat it doesn't matter made us famous in the wrong way <laughs> <laughs> that's basically right matt what are you seeing with the um uh, the ads on the TV and just how 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 the each candidates uh, approaching this election. Every time I see uh, Kelly Loeffler seems to be making this about like marijuana and Tiger King. I'm I'm really I'm trying to understand um, the the different approaches. And you're probably getting inundated by uh, a, a lot a lot of advertising. And yeah, I consider myself um, uh, quite the expert on this uh, because I watch a lot of Hulu um, and I watch a lot of 
you lose him. Yeah, for a uh, moment. Streaming TV, so I can't enjoy, you know, uh, these ads. Um, but yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Leffler ads against Warnock are particularly vicious. Um, and the general idea, I think, is, is, is to smear him as, as a communist and as a black radical. Um, there are ads uh, featuring Fidel Castro, uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who we remember from 2008, um, charging Warnock with sort of anti-Americanism but from, you know, cherry picking and taking out of context certain uh, phrases and verses from sermons, um, sometimes none at all. They just show sort of images of communists. Um, and um, uh, ironically, is a lot of the same sort of attacks that were leveled against Martin Luther King, who was a reverend at the same church that Warnock is uh, now heading. Um, but it's this idea of, you know, this old, you know, it's, it's not an institutionalized form of red baiting like we saw in the 1950s or even in, into the 1960s. Um, but it is sort of this... Um, weapon to paint reform as radicalism and all radicalism as treasonous or disloyalty in some way. So the idea of civil rights are communist, communism is un-American, so therefore civil rights are actually un-American. Um, and it's not, it, go ahead, Frank. No, I was just going to inject, does Warnick at least get credit for bringing religious extremists and famous atheists together? Like he's got Castro and Wright, that's, <laughs> you think of guys... That's a coalition right there. Racial theology right there. No, um, you're thinking too abstractly for, uh, for whoever's putting these videos together. Um, but Warnock, I think these videos do demonstrate that Warnock, uh, Republicans do see Warnock as the bigger threat. And as I said, he's too, generally speaking, he's probably too Ossoff's left. Um, and I think more than Ossoff, he has the capacity to sort of sustain Democratic voter excitement and turn out non-white voters in large numbers in January. And I think Republicans obviously identify that because those, those Warnock ads are pretty hostile. And I, I mean, I don't know how much truth there is to, I haven't read his book. Uh, Warnock has a book, um, the, uh, the, the Two Faces of the, of the Black Church or something like that, I can't remember. Um, but apparently there are some sort of less than, you know, less than hostile words towards socialist um, politics and even Marxism in that book um, that, that Leffler is playing fast and loose with. Um, but this is, this is, you know, this is, this is old time red baiting stuff by, by and large. Um, and it's not just limited to the Leffler campaigns, actually Purdue. Um, I, I don't know if you saw this in the news that he had, um, uh, his campaign had, had, had posted an image of, of, uh, Ossoff with an elongated nose. They had, they had, uh, you know, used this sort of stereotypically Jewish physiognomy to, to make Ossoff seem, um, like a sort of Jewish caricature. Um, they've also, you know, uh, Purdue has just called, you know, Ossoff blatantly a socialist. He's, I, I, am a member of, of, of DSA Atlanta Metro. And I promise you, Josh, John Ossoff is not. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the other ads are, they're pairing him with unpopular national Democrats like Pelosi and Schumer and other things, but it's, it's pretty nasty, racist, vile stuff. Um, on the democratic side, the, the, uh, the negative ads have mostly focused on, um, the insider trading issue. So uh, Purdue uh, dumping casino stock uh, the same day as the private Senate uh, COVID meeting um, and picking up Pfizer stock. Leffler doing the same thing. I think she dumped $19 million worth of stock the same day that the Senate was, you know, got a briefing on COVID back in January of 20. Um, so it's focused a lot on corruption. It's focused a lot on healthcare um, and pandemic relief. Um, not, not, not on the same level. Well, I, I, well, the one thing I did want to mention is I've been surprised by the, how these ads have, have, have not focused on the massive disparity that Frank mentioned between two candidates who are, you know, John Ossoff is a millionaire, a, a, very, a very low caliber millionaire. Uh, Raphael Warnock almost certainly is not. Um, and then they're opposed by uh, two candidates whose net worth combined is, you know, well in excess of half a billion dollars. Um, that uh, it's, it's curious to me that the sort of dearth of class politics in the Democratic attack ads, sort of no reference to these material divides, no indication that this is really a contest, a contest between plutocrats on one side and sort of regular elites on the other. But that somehow the, the populism works from the right in that dynamic is, is hard to wrap your head around. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, we can go. We can go look at 2020, and I'm not a member of DSA, but I I hate the Republicans. So you know, full disclosure. Um, and 
coming out of the election, of course, leave it to Democrats to feel like we lost, even though we actually won the thing. But in the recriminations about why we didn't win bigger, I mean, democratic populism is is one thing I've I've heard. Um, I had a family member who ran for office in rural Iowa, and she lost. Um, and I'm looking at the Iowa, you know, autopsy where Democrats thought they were going to do much better, they just got wiped out. Um, you know, they they ran on health care. They ran on the, the party of responsibility. Um, they were going to help farmers. You know, everything was very earnest and decent. They didn't go door to door. And, you know, Republicans accused them of being, um, you know, at Satan's, Satan's orgy every Thursday, um, which meets in Brussels, by the way. And the, the, um, the counter was, you know, Democrats have to try some, have to try some populism back at these folks. It's a big, I mean, there are lots of reasons why that may not be as workable for Democrats, but I, I do wonder, like, you know, if you go back to the New Deal, the Democrats were populists. They would attack these people as plutocrats and, and they would be mean to them. They would, they would hit them hard for a whole bunch of stereotypes about rich people screwing the poor. Um, and that, you know, that, that line of attack, that's, that's missing. I don't know if bringing it back would be the answer, but why not? Well, Frank, thanks for reminding us that the reason that this runoff election is so crucial is that Gideon didn't win in Maine, Greenfield didn't win in Iowa, Bullock didn't win in Montana, and whatever strategy, whatever message they were um, floating, it didn't work. Um, and I don't know, Matt, if you're saying, eh, it's, it's looking a lot like Warnock and Ossoff Oss are, are, are kind of do, using this tepid playbook that's uh, concerning. Um, maybe Ossoff more than Warnock. I don't know. I, I'd have to really sit down and sort of analyze their, their messaging. Um, I don't think that, that Warnock would be one to sort of run away from populist politics. Um, but, uh, and you know, in some ways he's going for a different, not a different, but a, you know, he's, he's, he's coming from a slightly di different uh, political background than, than Ossoff, um, who uh, is from the Atlanta suburbs, is highly focused. Uh, his strategy, even in 2017, was highly focused on a certain, you know, um, on winning uh, certain income levels of white voters in, 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 in suburban Atlanta. Um, and I don't want to make a, a broad claim about, you know, uh, what Democrats should or shouldn't do everywhere. Um, clearly, I think, though, um, Pop, a, a, an injection of populism is workable in, in many cases, in many scenarios, and is much needed in many scenarios. Um, and, you know, as I spoke to earlier, this, this, what you see in Georgia, I don't know, and, and, and Frank, you know, sort of pondered the, the long-term implications of this, but what, is, what does a coalition look like? Um, is it sustainable, uh, first of all, uh, when you have a political coalition between the wealthiest people in the state and, and the, the most working class people in the state? Um, what are the limits of that kind of coalition? Um, what does uh, the source of democratic gains in places like Georgia and Virginia and, and elsewhere um, that are relying on wider, wealthier suburbanites, what do they mean for, for the party? What do they say about the limits of, of populism that the, that the party can achieve? Um, by definition, yeah. these are voters who have more conservative views on economics, even though they're probably very liberal on things like gay marriage, um, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, maybe even racial justice issues, other sort of uh, cultural issues, uh, pro-choice. Pro, pro um, but uh, almost by definition um, are, are, are probably behind, even in some places, um, the Republican electorate um, on certain economic issues. We saw right in some of these ballot initiatives that Republican voters are not mechanically reactionary on economic planks. I mean, in some cases, you know, particularly like marijuana, the minimum wage, there are large swaths of Republican voters who are to the left of even Biden. Um, so um, what, what does that mean? And how do you tap into that impulse? So here's, here's a, here's a thing about this, you know, when the, when political scientists look at what people are for, I mean, again, partisanship seems to be subsuming everything. So middle class liberals, or, you know, um, suburban Democrats, are more progressive on a lot of economic issues than working class Trump voters. Um, but generally when they get framed as partisan issues. So yeah, we want to raise the minimum wage. Yeah, we want to tax the rich. You know, um, right. 
And if if the Republicans flip the script, they might they might be in a different place. I mean, I, I totally agree with you, Matt, that how you know, how does a party of suburbia and the and the poorest part of the country um, work? Now, of course, that alliance would be great if those two groups could really work together. That would be wonderful. But there's some clear there's some clear um, divides in what they're for. <laughs> I think one thing that Democrats worried about coming out of the election was, is Trump going to start picking up non-white working class voters? Um, you know, sort of the rum, you know, he, he'd, ar he'd already gotten Ice Cube, you know, and that guy's from the hood, at least was at one point, and, and 50 Cent was curious. And um, I don't know, uh, who, you know, he got some Hispanic votes that maybe there's this thing. And Marco Rubio was like, we've got to become the party of the working class. Like, Good luck, buddy. Go put the minimum wage up there right now on the lame duck and get it, you know, and show us your cred. They're never going to do that. Um, the other side is equally problematic. I mean, how do the Republicans really sustain being the party of the working man and, unless it's entirely through, excuse my English, bullshit about conspiracies and all this other stuff or, you know, trying to distort the records and say, that the stuff they did in the election, which was um, which was a kind of misinformation campaign, um, neither party is delivering for the for the fifty percent of America, um, for the poorest fifty percent of America. Democrats do a little better, but trying to get those issues as as the things that really drive elections, I think, would be is sort of a third question here. You know, as you're saying, Matt. They're not really front and center. Healthcare is the proxy for democratic um, uh, labor legislation. It's a pretty weak one. I mean, I'm in Canada. The idea that Obamacare is socialism, I have, I have like conservative students like, yeah, that, there's, I hear there's socialism in America. What's your, you go to the doctor for free, you moron. What is your, you. Oh, to, to your point, Frank, and this is a fascinating exit poll takeaway from Georgia, uh, is that almost 70% of Georgia voters support and this is the quotes, or this is the, the phrase that was used, government-run health care. Not attached to any political party. If you called it Trump care, Republic, a majority of Republicans would support it. If you called it Obamacare, a, a majority of liberals would support it. Um, uh, and then, of course, you have, you know, Obamacare kind of, you know, this health care has been a major issue in these ads and in, in this campaign, but we don't really know what what it means. There's a lot of, you know, the a majority of Georgians want Obamacare gone. Some of those Georgians want Obamacare gone because it has failed to live up to what they thought it could do in the middle of a pandemic. Um, others just see Obama, the word, and, and, and uh, want it repealed. Um, Warnock and Ossoff both support a public option. We don't really know what a public option actually means. Of course, this is what Biden supports as well, but he's talked about it in various terms. Is it limited to lower income Americans? Is it means tested? Is it, you know, um, what, what, is he, what does he really mean by public option? And the other thing that, I, that, you, that you mentioned, Frank, that I, I want to touch on real quick or expound on real quick um, is uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that when we talk about working class voters, um, we should remember that 40% of Americans who are eligible to vote don't vote in any given election. Um, and sometimes it's higher than that. I mean, that's in, and that's in a presidential election. Um, and those voters, those non-voters skew, of course, lower income, uh, more racially diverse and young. Um, so we're talking about um, a party that in the Republican Party talking about and these Leffler ads are you know, a perfect example of this, talking about being uh, identifying with the working class as so someone worth half a billion dollars, identifying with the working class. Uh, painting her opponent as anti-working class, someone who literally grew up in the housing projects of Savannah. Um, and at the same time, they're, 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 they're tending to be a working class party, but they are speaking directly to, bourgeois, to, to the ownership managerial class of, of, white, um, of white voters. So the, the Democratic, the Republican base is a petty bourgeois base, to put it in sort of Marxist terms. Um, they see themselves as working people, that is an identity that many of them have adopted, but these are people who drive forty, fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollar vehicles, live in you know three hundred thousand dollar homes. These are the biggest Trump supporters and Trump donors. Um, the working class is not really represented by anybody. Um, Democrats are slightly better at it, and Republicans uh, try to appeal to some white workers through, as you say, bullshit and sort of white nationalism, white identity politics, Christian identity politics, things like that. I mean, this was, this was the, I remember Thomas Franks, what's the matter with Kansas? You know, one of his 
observations there was um, suburban Kansas City was full of people who called themselves members of the working class. It's like, what? What are you talking about? But that's, yeah, but I work. Sure. Oh, fine. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's pride in labor versus right. those people that are getting the government check. Um, and we would be, we're, we're, we're losing some time here and we'd be really remiss if we didn't talk about the COVID overlay. You've spoken yeah. about public health. Um, we've got an electorate that's just been hammered for uh, decades on, you know, government isn't the solution. Government is the problem. And we've got a health, public health emergency where clearly government is going to have to um, get us to uh, some sense of a functional um, society again. Um, so, Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm curious how COVID is, is, is playing in, in Georgia. I mean, what your, what your uh, state restrictions are, it's probably not a mandatory mass state. You were uh, talking about, you know, the hyper-masculinity. Um, so I, any, any shape you can give to that would be really helpful. Yeah, COVID has been, uh, and especially in the election cycle, but really in, in many ways has been this sort of prism through which so many other political issues have filtered out and become illuminated. Um, um, and, and really in many ways, this runoff is, is a mandate uh, on, on COVID um, because you have um, two, you know, people like Warnock and Ossoff who are doing drive-by rallies um, they're, you know, they're selling masks on their, on their campaign sites, um, fully in line with the sort of scientific consensus and the CDC guidelines and everything else. Then on the uh, flip side of that, you have uh, Leffler and Purdue, who have both basically repeated, in, some case, in most cases verbatim, Trump's rhetoric about first it being a hoax, um, then it being sort of these um, um, anti-Chinese, xenophobic, um, connections that, you know, China will pay for this or that, you know, they sort of connected to these traditional, you know, anti-Chinese racism having to do with food or uncleanliness or, or whatever else it is, um, you know, downplaying the, the scientific risks, um, laughing in, in the face of basic science. Um, uh, Purdue, to I guess his most basic credit, has encouraged hand washing and face mask wearing. Leffler's position is almost explicitly anti-mask. Uh, she's had COVID at least once from from appearance appearing at you know public rallies uh, with an with no mask on. Um, uh, Purdue though has has repeated you know these COVID fabrications, um, um, talking repeatedly about how it was you know wor no worse than the seasonal flu, about how the flu kills more people, um, and they've of course of, both opposed additional pandemic relief, opposed any kind of lockdown, any kind of restrictions. And to that end, um, if you look at the people who voted for Purdue and Leffler in the exit polls, their number one, um, their number one sort of priority uh, as far as issues were concerned was uh, the economy, um, however you want to frame that. Basically, um, stay open. You know, they, they stay open. Um, whereas uh, on the flip side, the, uh, the voters for Ossoff and uh, Warnock uh, almost tied for, for the single biggest thing were racial inequality, and uh, COVID response relief, um, um, and this is uh, you know this is this has shown up, of course, in the ethics complaints too against both Leffler and uh, and uh, Purdue that I mentioned about them, you know, stock dumping and stock buying on the day that they received Senate briefings. Well, here's sure. you know, <clears throat> I was trying to think of has there been something like this in let's say the 1945 to 1970 period where um, Americans were this divided about a clear public crisis. I mean, civil rights, Vietnam, really divisive issues, but they, they weren't quite the same as the pandemic. Um, coming into it, you would think like, this is not, this is not gonna be one that turns into the red blue thing, but of course it did. Um, and that's, you know, uh, that's really bad. I mean, for, for public health that, that the thing got politicized. But it does, it does signal something about, you know, where, where the times are um, in, in the states. And I say this from up here where there's, that's happening. You know, there is an anti-mask crowd in Western Canada in particular, they're strong. But um, our, our premier, Justin Trudeau, is very popular, probably on his way to re-election. Um, and he's, you know, he's been, he's been good enough. Um, 
lots of countries have been able to do this without the really sharp partisan divide over it. Um, and that's, that's a, you know, it's a symptom of what the polarization stuff has done. Um, because of course, you know, the countries that have had their economies really do well are, are Germany, um, uh, folks, who, folks who handled it, South Korea, the, the places with the lowest COVID have had their economies come back. And so it's just turned into this kind of crazy rhetorical thing. You could see economic incentives for, hey, make everybody go back to work. I don't have to pay any extra taxes. I want to make, you know, if I'm one of these machinators at the top, if we have a big public response, it'll just empower government. I can sort of understand that argument. But for folks on the, um, you know, uh, who aren't in those positions, um, there's a real logic of saying, no, don't put me to work. Do what these other places have done. Pay me to stay home and keep everybody safe. And that just never, never got off the ground in the States. And for whatever that was. And we're in a place right now in this country where the good people of Georgia um, hold the possibility of functional government in their hands. If, if, both, if both of these Democratic um, challengers go to Washington, um, the odds of a, a stimulus checks to individuals and also to help with state budgets are, are, are much more likely. Um, so it, it's, it's just, it, it's incredible the amount of power that Georgia voter has right now. It's just, uh, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I'm. Do you think, do you think voters are, are voting on that? Like this is for the control of the Senate. It's basically like a redo of the presidential. It's, 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 it's making, I, for me, it's making Biden the actual, you know, the actual president. Um, he's going to have an impossible time with McConnell and, and a Republican Senate with all the chairs being Republicans. Uh, it's, I think the only way forward is, is, is if he has a, a functioning legislative branch. Do, do, do the, do, I, I guess it's for Matt, our man on the ground. Um, do you think there's that 0.3% still out there that, will get their shit together and say, yeah, we got to do this because it's, it's just, it's, it's like the election we just had. I have no idea, Frank. Um, and I don't know if, if the better strategy is to try to flip that 0.3% or to, 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 to go find the other percent, the other 35% who didn't vote. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I don't know who will be discouraged by the Republican sort of civil war going on between Leffler and Purdue and Raffensperger. I don't know who will be galvanized by that. I don't know what impact the personalities in the race will have. I, I have, I have no idea. I wish I knew. What about, I mean, uh, this is, I, I realize Mike's asking the questions, but I, I, tell okay. us more about Stacey Abrams, because she's now held up as, you know, the savior. She did, yeah. she is the symbol of get out the vote. The Democrats blew in Florida, messed up on state after state, but they did it right in Georgia. Is, is she really doing something different there? You, can you sort of see it? Um, well, I, I wish, you know, one of, one of my regrets, one of the, one of the things that I uh, missed most about the pandemic and, and having a, you know, an infant in the house is that I haven't really been able, I haven't really been on the ground. I haven't been able to do much anything politically uh, this year. I um, did some, you know, phone banking for, for Sanders during the primary. I, I uh, you know, made a, a donation here and there, but I haven't been, I haven't been knocking on doors. I haven't been doing anything in terms of grassroots organizing or voter drives that I've done in the past. Um, but, you know, Stacey Abrams with, uh, you know, Fair Fight and then before that, the New Georgia Project. Um, there were, I don't know, there were at least half a dozen major get out the vote initiatives here in my town, in Albany, um, that, um, uh, that I saw making at least, uh, I, you know, I, I know that turnout was high. Um, but uh, those, 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 those voters, th that, that voter registration ended up being uh, really imperative because Republican turnout was high as well. Um, so it was, um, it was sort of a race to, to drive up turnout. Um, and, and I will make, yeah, I think to, to, to speak to a point we made earlier that the, the Democratic gains owe a lot less to sort of demographics and destiny than to grassroots organizing and voter drives that, I mean, some of my friends and students have worked tirelessly under awful conditions, you know, during the pandemic. Um, and well, and I've had a particularly brutal semester uh, teaching as well. So um, I, uh, my on the ground experience has been very, very limited in that regard. But yeah, there have been, a, you know, the, the, the role of Abrams and, 
Um, she's gotten a lot of credit, but there are a lot of people doing a lot of work. Um, she's just become the sort of the figurehead for a an army of of grass. And that's a uh, that's a measure of um, its voter registration in Georgia that I've never. I'm um, living in either here or Ohio. That's a that's a real measure of um, motivation and enthusiasm, which uh, traditionally dies off um, during a runoff. So the, the, the hope is that um, the voters of Georgia realize how much they're holding in their hands right now and they get out there and, um, you know, give us a Senate that we, we can actually imagine um, yeah. functioning. Um, so, uh, guys, we're way past time, but we've had a blast. And I, I want to thank you so much, Frank Towers and Matt Stanley. Um, uh, two, as you, as you can tell, very knowledgeable historians who can, uh, well, make things a little relatable because uh, it's, 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 it's quite disturbing what we've, we've lived through. And, and it's really this whole decade has been a, just a disaster. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to turning the calendar to 2021. The 20s will officially start, right, when you start saying one. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, have, we'll have a nice progressive decade. Guaranteed. We will. Sounds Excellent good, Mike. Optimism. Mike, thanks. This was tons of tons of fun and great to see you and good to see you again, Matt. Likewise. Thanks, Mike. All right, signing off. Georgia. 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 Please, 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 please